Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fantasy of the Ages, the show where father and son sit down and talk about fantasy, science fiction, and whatever other nerdiness we feel like talking about on a given day. Today, there is no Zach with me. It's just me. But it is not just me, because we have a special episode for you on this live stream today, where I have an author joining us, someone who wrote that book that's on my screen behind me here, The Trials of Ashmount, and I want to bring him in here and introduce him. So, John, let's get you onto the screen. Hey, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. That is my absolute pleasure. I had the chance to encounter your book. I think it was back in January that I read it. I might have started in December. And I, I couldn't shut up about it because it was so much fun. Uh, I'm just enjoying the book from day one. And I'm tweeting about it. And then at some point, you start jumping in on the tweets saying, hey, glad you're enjoying it. And anytime a content creator hears back from the author when they're speaking about the things they're enjoying about a book is always kind of fun. But you were kind of next level because we actually started having real conversations, not just someone's liking my <laughs> tweet. And uh, I appreciated that. And we've stayed kind of communicating on stuff along the way. And now here we are. We've got you on an episode here today. And thanks for being here. I think we're going to have some fun today. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I just kind of every once in a while on Twitter, search the title of my book because I like to see... Is anyone talking about it? And that's how I just like randomly found you. <laughs> You're like, please, like, oh, somebody cool. be talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because uh, I've been on the Twitter feed before where you're just kind of scrolling. And all of a sudden I find like, someone was talking about my book and I had no idea they were even reading it. And I was like, oh my God, is there other people that are doing this? So I started searching every once in a while because I was curious. And mm -hmm. I found a couple mm -hmm. people who like, I didn't know. I know like, this book was terrible. DNF'd. And then, you know, I found you. So it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two way street there. Sometimes, sure. uh, sometimes you get good things and sometimes you get bad things, but uh, I can roll with the punches. So it's worth it. There you go. You know, you kind of put yourself out there when you publish a book and it's out into the world, it's into the wild and you have no control over what people think of the book. And we're going to talk more about your book, certainly, as we get into this here. And and I'm interested, and I know our viewers are interested in, you know, what kinds of things are going on in your head as you hear feedback, as you come up with this stuff in the first place. And we'll talk about all these sorts of things. But on our show, there's something critical that we always talk about before we get into content, and that's what we're drinking. Because we believe drinking makes our content better. It might be <laughs> when others are drinking, our content is better. I sometimes get that mixed up. But I am drinking something today. Now, this is just white wine. I have nothing fancy today. Uh, just a simple white table wine. It's not even a special wine. You know, Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc. No, it's just a blend. It's boring. Because <laughs> this is my first day back content creating after a week-long vacation cruise with an unlimited drink package, oh, <laughs> which drives this frugal guy to drink enough to make it have value that I bought the unlimited drink package. <laughs> so I'm saturated right now. <laughs> so, so just a little easy white wine is in my wheelhouse today. That's great. It's, it's not obligatory, but we always like to ask guests then, are you drinking anything today? I, I, I am even more bland than you are. I have my <laughs> little uh, thermos here of ice water. Ice water is all I drink. Uh, I'm very bland when it comes to drinks. Why is it the only thing I drink? I don't know. I just really like the hydration I feel when I drink it, I guess. I, Good. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, everything, you know, most other drinks seem to just make me thirstier. And so that annoys me. <laughs> I get that. You know, most people don't drink enough water. And I do. I hydrate all day long. And when I'm drinking alcohol, then I'm like every other drink is another home big chug of water. Kind of stay hydrated. But your brain works better when you are hydrated. And I notice if I haven't been drinking enough water, 
uh, focus gets a little worse. It's harder to stay on track. So especially since you're here talking about your book, your writing experience, I'm glad you're drinking water and we won't get fuzzy <laughs> comments. Yeah, that's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, let me let me just let our viewers here know. And, and I do want to say hey to those who are with us live in the live stream. Glad you're here with us today. But also all of you who are watching this later when we drop this as a regular episode on the channel. This is a spoiler light episode. Most of our content on Fantasy for the Ages comes out this way. So when we talk about books, literature, even media we've consumed, we usually don't ruin the plot. We want to talk about what things in ways that if people have already read or watched this stuff, they know what we're talking about. They're enjoying it. They get it. And we might hint at some things and they're like, oh, I know what you just did there. You know, and we can have fun with that. But we never want to spoil the experience for someone who hasn't read or watched what we're talking about. So as we do spend some time talking about the trials of Ash Mount, we're not going to ruin the story. We're not going to give it away because I'm hoping some people will watch this episode and then we'll go, why have I waited so long? I got to go find this book now. And it will be a great experience for them. So you're safe if you haven't read this book yet as you watch this episode. So I got a bunch of questions. We're just going to go into and we'll see where the conversation goes. John, the first right. thing I have for you is what got you into writing in the first place, this book, and then trying to get it published? You know, tell us how you came about to this decision. All right. Uh, so I guess real quick, writing in general, I've always uh, kind of written. Uh, I started when I was in high school and was terrible. I, I made no <laughs> excuses for the crap that I wrote about when I now, was How do you school. know you were terrible? Were people throwing vegetables at you? I mean, what? Yeah. I had friends who were brutally honest and <laughs> did read go. and give me feedback. And uh, to be fair, it was justified, but <laughs> it was really bad. But We uh, all have so, to crawl before we can walk, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, I think I was in a 11th grade. And my friend had told me, uh, I don't actually know the exact statistics on this, but my friend had told me it was something like 1% of every single person who's ever tried to write, like, write a book fails or succeeds. I'm sorry, 1% succeeds. And I was like, that can't be true. And I'm going to do it. And he was like, you're not going to do it because one only 1% 1 succeed. So I sat down and I wrote a whole book in my 11th uh, grade year of high school. I, I wrote an entire book. And in my senior year, I wrote the like half of a sequel. And so I, I kind of proved myself at a very young age that I could do it. And then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I started going to college and working and and I, I wanted to always write, but I never got enough time. When I'm working or in college, I have this like one track mind, I think. Uh, if I'm doing both working and college, I tend to just focus on one and neglect the other. And uh, when I am only doing one, uh, if I'm full-time in college or full-time working, I just, uh, this might sound a little pathetic because I know a lot of authors go through that struggle of like, I worked three jobs and wrote my first novel. But for me, I just get too mentally taxed, I guess. I come home from work. Uh, I'm tired. I don't feel mm -hmm. like writing. So I kind of never really tried again. And then COVID happened. Ah. And yeah, when COVID happened, uh, my, my job, I was an assistant manager at Burger King, actually. And they kind of reduced my hours, reduced the amount of help I had, took away my vacation docked my pay. They did all these things because, or I think they tried to dock the pay. And I sent a very, very wordy email to the uh, CEO. And I also actually contacted a news source. <laughs> they wrote a whole article about it. And uh, so, yeah, I was not happy. Uh, so I ended up quitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, ironically, uh, I think it was like two or three weeks after I quit, I also got my bachelor's degree. 
uh, in business management. But COVID was happening, so no one was hiring. And I didn't really want a job at the time anyway because of everything that just happened between COVID, between my last job, uh, sure. between not knowing where society was going. Uh, and I was just like, I'm going to sit down and write this book. Now, uh, the idea for The Trials of Ashmount, uh, this kind of touches us on like a, a later question, I think, which refers to the magic systems. Uh, but the reason I wrote this book specifically was because way back in high school, I actually had this idea for a magic system, which was that it was tied to your life force and uh, that as you used it, you kind of like aged in real like life like real time i mean mm -hmm. and so i just kind of sat down and i started writing with that idea in my mind and also with the idea that i wanted to make a serious go at actually putting a book out there and then i i did it you know i, I finished the book after i had to i wrote like eighty thousand uh words so it was like just about half of the book and i posted in a writing group for feedback and i was like hey what do you guys think and you know i got similar feedback that i got when i was in high school basically it was trash <laughs> but i i asked them to be brutally honest okay. and they were and that was great but when i found that out i was like damn it my writing has not improved since i was a kid really uh, now, I'm an excellent uh, essay writer, so straight A, like, if it comes to essays for, like, English class or whatever, I mm -hmm. am fantastic. I will always get an A on a paper. Uh, but creatively, I didn't know a lot of the rules, uh, so I was, you know, my dialogue tags were all messy. Uh, I used way too many adverbs and passive voice and all these, uh, you know, I don't think you have to abide by these rules, but if you use them overly much, you it can just get uh, really, it can just get really uh, overwhelming. I think like very samey or amateurish. I guess uh, in the indie world, especially, they seem to judge this stuff way more than if you're traditionally published because mm -hmm. people talk about great writers. Uh, yeah, I'm reading Robin Hobb right now, and she uses a ton of both uh, adverbs and passive voice and no one ever complains about her skill because right. you know she's she's a very great writer but for some reason i don't like people, her writing by the way <laughs> that's funny. i'm not on the robin uh, hobb train i am not so yeah <laughs> I, I mean i'm a big fan so far but i can understand why people wouldn't be i mean you're enjoying malazan right i oh man that shit. loving it <laughs> Um, now I, th I would say that the writing technique, uh, not to get off track, but just real quick to clarify my comments, uh, I will say Erickson, fantastic writer, but I finished the first book and I didn't, I realized I didn't understand a single thing that happened. And I was like, okay, obviously this isn't for me. <laughs> He's technically a great writer, but I didn't understand it. I think it's just a me problem. Uh, so, but you know every book is going to land differently for different people, You know, that right? that's what I hear. Uh, with with Malazan, that's kind of the thing. Either you get it, or it's not your thing. Because right. there is some complexity involved. There's some things where he's not telling you what you might want to know, and you're going to have to wait and be patient or figure it out. And some people are like, no, give me more. Give me more. You know, and yeah, right. that's it. But you're you're so right, John, about the rules. The rules of writing. Rules are meant to be broken. Lots of authors who are very successful don't follow. I mean, rule schmools. What matters is do people enjoy the story? Are they sucked in? Are they engaged? And when I read your story, that's what happened to me. Uh, I could not. I'm not a literary analytic critic. I could not tell you about the quality of your prose, which some it's podcasts terrible. talk about. That's not me, okay? <laughs> I'm a fan of good stories. So I read your book. I got the story. I was engaged. And then I can see the pictures, you know, cinematically. I can picture what you're talking about, what's happening. And, and you forget about the actual words on the page then. 
where it's successful as a writer then is if you write well enough that someone can be seeing the story in their mind and nothing's pulling you out of the story. Because, wow, that was really badly written and I couldn't follow it. That's <laughs> the only rule you have to follow is don't take the person out of the story. For right. me, uh, you succeeded in that. I thank you. I appreciate that. It's uh, it's always good to hear when someone says that it just like sucked them in because – I think that's, you know, as a reader myself, that's what I want is for something to just pull me in and uh, absorb me. And if it if it's able to do that, uh, I think that you forgive uh, you forgive any uh, bad, you know, not bad writing, but occasional mistakes or uh, anything that's, you know, uh, maybe a missing comma or something that's like, ah, why did you do that? Uh, and every book has that, of course. But, uh, you know, I was actually just looking at the Trials of Ashmount, the first uh, chapter the other day. And it, the first time I noticed, oh, my God, there's a missing quotation. And no. Don't you hate that then? You hate <laughs> that when you find it now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so annoying. Uh, you know, I just, the dialogue, it's just like a, I think it's like a single sentence and it just ends with, no quote. And, uh, it well, just bothers me. I don't remember it. <laughs> so I didn't catch it. You know, and somebody will out there. You know, some of our, our viewers here are pointing out some things. I can put this one in. Jonathan saying it's infinitely easier to give critique than it is to create in the first place, you know. And uh, also saying critics are a dime a dozen. You know, absolutely. There sure. are so many things that you can find wrong with any story if you if that's what you're looking for. And you mentioned indie authors. People love to critique them more than anyone. You know, it's like, oh, it's it's just indie stuff. It's gonna be, you know, subpar. <laughs> I'm like, that's that's crap. Um, it's either a good story or it's not. It doesn't really matter who read it, who wrote it. Anyone is going to uh be capable of writing a good story some of them get pub picked up by a big publisher some right. don't and have to self-publish doesn't change it being a great story it's the story itself that matters now speaking of this particular story and i'm, I'm gonna jump back out because i end up i gesture and when i keep in the small format <laughs> my arms disappear off the side so we'll keep it keep it wide here uh Zach also watched this. He's sorry he couldn't be with us here live today, but he's actually working. Dude's got a job that goes in the evening sometimes, so that's the way it is. What can you do, right? Yeah, you know, a paycheck's important for him. He's young. He needs the money. All right, that's fine. I'm, I'm old. I need the money, too. But I'm off today, so <laughs> this is fine. And you're East Coast, right? I am. I live in uh, New York, actually. So it's already evening early evening out by you as we're recording this so right easy peasy but zach did give me some questions to ask specifically because he read your book much more recently now and he loved it he was a big fan too i'm sure we thank will you. do thank you zach <laughs> i'm sure the two of us he and i will do an episode collaborating just talking about this maybe just before your next one comes out which we'll talk about in a moment but some of his questions he submitted which i'll do on his behalf and this is the first one what genre or sub-genre do you personally consider the Trials of Ashmount to best fit into? You know, someone's thinking about whether they want to read this book or not. Where would you place it? Uh, so I advertise it as grimdark fantasy, but I do understand why some people say it's not grimdark. Uh it really the problem with the grimdark is it's really dependent on each person's individual definition of grimdark so totally uh, i consider joe abercrombie and george r, r. martin to be grimdark authors yes some people do not uh i think those people are crazy but uh i i personally think they're you know those are my, also my two biggest like inspirations and uh favorite authors but uh i would i while the prose might not read as super dark and uh, grim darkish like a lot of grim dark can, uh, there are a lot of grim dark 
things that happen. And I didn't want like a Wheel of Time reader to see the cover and be like, oh, well, another great, cool little adventure. And uh, so I, I specifically, you know, I want to emphasize to the normal epic fantasy reader maybe that this is darker than uh, a lot of normal or regular epic fantasy, I guess. Sure, uh, sure. You know, as I read it, it definitely fit into grim dark for me. I mean, it ticks off the boxes. Um, is it the darkest grim dark I've read? No, but it's definitely grim dark. I mean, just the way it starts out. Wow, this character's <laughs> screwed, you know, right off the bat. Again, no spoilers, but if you read this book, you'll know what I'm talking about. You waste no time in taking one person's life and just put it in, in the tank, you know. Um, this is elements of Grimdark. Uh, but you also have, you know, there's, there's hope, there's light, there's positive possibilities uh, for your, the various characters as they move forward through here. So... I don't know, Grimdark Light? Can we, can we call that? Is that a thing? You know, I've we heard... shouldn't get too wrapped up in, in pegging <laughs> it on the, on the specific character. Right. I, have, I have heard someone call it uh, Grim Hope. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Grim Hope. All right. Here, okay, you guys all heard it. John Palladino starting a new category in fantasy, the subgenre <laughs> of Grim Hope. I'll be looking for more to put into the category. All right, here's another question for you, John. From Zach again. Do you have any particular inspirations for the core characters in this book? I mean, how do you come up with these, these particular characters? Again, don't spoil any, but you feel free to name you know, any characters. Those who've read it will know who you mean, and those who won't will know what you mean when they get to it. So any, any particular inspirations for some of these core characters? All right, so I'd like to talk about uh, six six characters. I think uh, the so the first two I'm going to name are inspired by uh, characters that Joe Abercrombie wrote. Uh, the first is Demry. Uh, he's not inspired a hundred percent by Glotha, but there are elements of that character type in in Demery. So I, I, when I first started writing, I was like, oh man, it'd be kind of cool to have this. Uh, yeah. Grimheart. It <laughs> um, <laughs> was worth showing. Right. Uh, I had this idea that like, I haven't, I haven't seen anyone really write someone that like stutters and like actually write out the stutter. Like I've always seen like, you know, this person stutters and, and I don't know why I really wanted to do that but I did. <laughs> so, so I did. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, what would be really cool is if I kind of make this character uh, kind of persecuted or uh, disliked by a lot of people for reasons that are spoilers. So I won't mention them, but, uh, and then later on, maybe, and that's subjective, but maybe you start to think differently about the situation depending on uh, how you view some of the major like plot points in the in the book. Mm -hmm. So the second character that was inspired by an Abercrombie character is uh, actually Royal, who is inspired by uh, what's his name, N Nicomo Koska, right? I think that's his name. Uh, okay. So the alcoholic. You know, Royal is also an alcoholic, a uh, bit different, but I like the idea of just having an alcoholic, I guess. And uh, so Royal is my take on that. Uh, he's the only side character I'm going to mention here, but the rest are the main characters. So uh, Sarah is, or Sarah Dahl, whatever, uh, she is... You get to call her whatever you want, by the way. You're the author, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, people call her uh, Sarah, Sarah Dell, Sarah, whatever. But I, I don't care how people, you know, pronounce the names. But I'm just going to say them how I wrote them. And 
This becomes canon. Uh, as soon as you say it on video, <laughs> it's canon now. I mean, that's fair. The uh, <laughs> that's true. It is canon, I suppose. But I also do like to emphasize that I don't care how you pronounce a, a name or anything like that. I know some people get really like annoyed by that. To Way me, too worked up. Don't Zach care. and I have fun arguing about names sometimes. But you're <laughs> right. It's it's a creative thing. It's fantasy. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. My aim is to create names that are easy to pronounce, even if you pronounce them, uh, and I'm putting like quotes around, but incorrectly, uh, because they're, I just think it's important that you can actually say the name and whether or not you get it like phonetically all the way, I, I, it doesn't matter as long as you have a name in your head when you read, sure. because there's sometimes you just get hung up and you're like, I can't even say this person's name. Uh, but Sarah wasn't really inspired by anyone or anything. Uh, it was just like, I, I think her and Keldon were kind of like my two, let's start them off in a really normal epic fantasy type setting with a really kind of like normal events and then kind of make it familiar to epic fantasy readers I think so that they have like this you know i live in this town and you know this bad thing happens or this opportunity arises and uh we go on our merry way and and then and then we kind of diverge from maybe what's uh, normal and epic fantasy, I guess. And well, Sarah is a great example because you're establishing kind of a hero's journey for her then that then goes grimdark. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Which is great. I, I love what you've done with her. Uh, and then, so she's not really inspired by anything other than that. But Keldon, I actually finished writing the book. And uh, when I was looking, there's two things that changed. That I wrote the book, the first draft. The first was Keldon, and I, I went through. I was rereading the book, and I was like, "Oh my god, Keldon is so boring. He's just, he's just the most bland main character. How am I going to change this without having to rewrite too much?" And I still think his chapter are kind of boring, but that's an author problem. Maybe I've heard people say they thought he was their favorite and most interesting character. That's all subjective, of course. But for me, as a writer. I didn't even like writing him <laughs> like throughout the first book. Uh, but I, I went back and I was like, I need to flesh this, this uh, series of chapters out. And so uh, how am I going to fix them? And so I was like, well, there's a really easy way to make him polarizing. I'll just insert my own thoughts about things into his head. And it made him a complete asshole. <laughs> I was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> i was like what would what would i think in this situation oh there it is oh my god people are gonna hate him he's a dick <laughs> yep, but that's what i would think and so i just went through and i kind of put in all these like uh and now again i'm not that bad he's kind of really <laughs> a dick uh so i did inflate that a little but it is really based on a lot of thoughts that i would have in situations like that because i a kid a little bit that I have a cold heart. I'm an emotionless person. I just tend not to get too bothered. And I get annoyed when other people do get bothered by a lot of things or emotionally, uh, you know, someone starts crying over something that I think is trivial, you know, whatever. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and then I have these like terrible thoughts in my head, like that I probably shouldn't have. But I have them anyway. <laughs> I can't help it. So uh, yeah, Keldon was entirely inspired by that part of me. Uh, once I realized he needed more personality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these tidbits are great so far, John. I, I'm like, <laughs> I got to go back and read the book again with these insights. That's what I'm feeling right now. So this is great. Uh, you had two more. Yes. So Edelbrock is uh, fun fact. Before I even talk about his inspiration, I wrote my entire first book posted for feedback listed or I think I posted for feedback on my blurb. It was like my original blurb, actually it's not the same uh -huh. blurb anymore, but I, I, which has the character and actually it's the, it's the one behind you right now, actually. So Edelbrock is um, a car parts manufacturing company. Apparently I did not know this. Okay. And someone told me that and they were like, you better change it. Cause like, that's 
people are going to look at that and read car parts, you know, people that are into cars. And I was like, crap. <laughs> I don't want to change it. <laughs> like, I always come up with my names from scratch by, uh, I use this uh, system that I didn't invent, but I say I, in my head, invented it to myself, really, which is very syllable based. So I will come up with different syllables that I like and then kind of try and mash them together. Uh, I, I learned this function from DMing D&D. &D. And okay. so when I, I or playing D&D, &D, whichever. And so say I wanted an elf name and I had no idea. And I hate, I absolutely hate looking at a list of names, picking one and using it. I can't do that. I, I feel like I just stole. It's not created by me. I know, guys, I'm not trying to upset anyone that does that, and I have no uh, no issues with anyone that does that. For Just for me personally, I'm it too much of a creative person. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think way back when I was a kid uh, and when we played 3.5, my friends had this book, and I, I think it was just like a, a, it was a thin book, and I think it was just uh, – tables of names for each race basically uh, i think it was just an extra supplement thing uh and so I'd, I'd go into that book and elf names and i would see like oh that's a really cool start but then i can use the whole name mix it up because, to something so else. then i yeah. kind of i maybe i'd find another part of a different name or i'd invent the next part myself or whatever but that's how I came up with names. And so I came up with Edelbrock in that way. I'm not a car person. I know nothing about cars. I had no I idea it's car thing. What? Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I don't know how to change windshield wipers. I like I I'm, okay, I'm I learned that one. YouTube, man. <laughs> YouTube teaches you anything. Come on. <laughs> I, I just uh I don't know anything about cars at all. I'm really car stupid. You know, I drove my mom's car a while ago and it took me 10 minutes to figure out how to open the gas tank once. Like, yeah, I know that's sad, but like, I'm really that inept when it comes to cars. Uh, cars are just not my thing. Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, I apologize to all the men out there who are really into <laughs> cars, but I don't know anything about them. So when I found out it was a car parts manufacturer, I was like, of course it is because I don't know anything about it, but I was really annoyed, but I had to keep it because I just really liked the name and it had already landed with me. So there you go. All right. And, and uh, come on, so. nobody's gotten back to you afterwards going, dude, what's with the guy named after the car part thing? <laughs> right. You haven't uh, heard that once, have you? I, I haven't. No. Uh, yeah, but another fine. thing, when I posted, uh, can't remember what I posted, but I had the first and last name of my five main characters. Keldon Stool. That's his last name. S-T-O-O-L-E. And the reason his last name is Stool was because I was like, I, I want something simple uh, that's going to maybe make him sound like a commoner. And so I kind of thought of a book I read, and I'm struggling right now to remember which book it was and what author it was, but the author's uh, character name was something and then i and i i really feel bad because i'm not remembering who it is and something and then furniture piece i don't remember what the furniture piece was i <laughs> uh, and i was like i'll do the same thing it'll make him sound kind of like oh, no, a you're simple thinking of kevin commoner. futon i'm sure that's yeah what you mean. exactly <laughs> kevin futon uh so i was like stool stool would be a great name and i can put an e on it and it makes it look like you know a real name and everyone was like I can't believe you just named your uh, character Kevin or Keldon shit. And I was like, oh my God, are you serious? That's what you I see? I figured that's where you were going. But no, uh, you have an E on the end. It's cool. Right. It works. Uh, so but again, I haven't heard any of that in reviews either. So uh, anyway, uh, Edelbrock's inspiration. Uh, basically, without giving spoilers, how fucked can I make one character? <laughs> Success. Success. <laughs> yes. That's it. <laughs> I have to so, admit, right up right away when you yeah. start off with that character, I did not. I'm like, I'm not getting this character. I don't care for this character. And he is so grown on me. Totally yeah, grown on it's me. It's funny. A lot of people say that. 
um i, I really like him myself uh yeah actually and cause... and so it comes through well done right yeah so uh then villic or as some other people say uh village uh, depending on who you are is totally inspired by uh my childhood actually so he's very introverted very shy and when i was a kid i was uh super super introverted and shy like beyond normal <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so if people talk to me uh then i kind of froze a lot of the time you know i was so scared to even approach a teacher to ask, like, go to the bathroom, that I would actually, like, in second grade, I wouldn't go to the bathroom. I'd end up shitting my pants because I was so Ooh. nervous to actually talk to them. I know it's now we've come right story. back to Mr. Stool. Look at that, Mr. Stool. <laughs> but so I, I remember those feelings still of like just being absolutely petrified if someone like approached me, and I was like, I'm gonna really put that into Zillic. And make him super, super shy, super like, nervous around just everyone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's kind yeah. of where that came from. Another great character you've created. Absolutely. Well, you've created a lot of great things in this story. And honestly, it, it I was impressed with the depth of what's gone into creating the story. Again, no spoilers on it. Just there's a lot in here. It's, it's very impressive from my perspective. One of those things is the magic system or systems. You know, I mean, the, there's some complexity here. And, and again, we have people listening who and watching who have not read this yet. So I'm not sure how much you can really say about it. But I, I'm just kind of what was going on in your head to be able <laughs> to come up with this. I know you talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, is there anything else you can say about yeah. What was so, behind designing this? Just to uh, reassure anyone that's listening about this and worried about spoilers, every single thing you might interpret as a spoiler happens in the character's basically like first or second chapter. I'm not spoiling anything far at all into the book. I'm uh, purposely trying to be very vague. So I'm only keeping it to the very early. Because guys, he wants you to read the book, which means he Uh. wants you to buy the book. (laughs) Trust us. He's not ruining it. (laughs) So the magic systems, I don't feel is a spoiler to get into, um, even though there are some learning and developments that come from them. But from, I guess we'll talk about the main system first. Uh, And I, I already told you how I kind of came up with the first concept, which was just... In high school, I thought it would be a really interesting thing to see someone, uh, you know, be able to transfer their life basically to someone else and heal them. Uh, and that's kind of like the first image I had was like a young person is mortally wounded and laying in a bed and dying. And this other person that's like 20 or whatever walks up to them and they're like, you're not going to die today. And they lay their hand on that person and fully heal them and the person that's laying in the bed looks up at this old person that's standing in front of them now because they just gave them their whole life basically and then that just kind of evolved from then i was like well how do i do that with like a combat sense how do i now what this seems kind of broken if everyone has magic and everyone has uh the ability to do all this stuff so i broke Mm -hmm. it into like five subsects so that you can't just do everything um and that does develop later on in the story but yeah we we can't talk uh, about that but yeah (laughs) (laughs) i was going Uh, there (laughs) yeah there's there's five branches so you have your healers uh your enforcers who are like your typical arcane magician i think in role-playing games that do fireball fireball Yeah. yeah yeah ice walls and and uh, whatever, calling down lightning, uh, you know, creating a great crater in the ground or or a pillar into the air, uh, sky. I don't know. Uh, whatever you can think of. They just can do stuff like that. Uh, they can control, you know, like force and, you know, just make people explode. It, they just do all this stuff. 
Uh, and then you have uh, your collectors who are kind of the same way, except they don't have the ability to use magic unless they kill someone that has the ability and uh, or they don't have to necessarily kill them themselves, but they go up to a person that died who had what's called uh, the trace, which is just the magic ab ability that's been unlocked in them. And then they're able to harvest this into these vials uh, and collect it and use that later as like a potion, I guess, uh, that you consume and then you can use magic for a little while without spending your own life. And they can also give that to the enforcers to uh, help them. Now, that mechanic hasn't been touched on much, uh, but I do promise in the future it will be. <laughs> Uh, and this this element of your magic system does lean into grimdark. I mean, think about that harvesting. What a word! Right. Harvest <laughs> the magic trace from people who are dead or dying. You know, ooh, ooh, yeah. Right. And then for enforcers to be able to use their magic, I have uh, glyphists who basically tie the ability uh, from your life to connect it to like the magical power inside of you so that you can actually use it and consume your life. Um, they make these like tattoos on their body that they consume, which is what is aging them. Uh, and then there's one other type of uh, the magic branch. And they're just people who can basically see what you can do uh, and identify if you have the ability to use magic. And uh, those people are, are really good like door guards i guess because they can immediately see magic oh, person this... magic person yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. this person coming in is uh clearly an enforcer which they didn't tell us that's not good uh so the, the idea behind all this was to make a very hard magic system with rules so that because i i and this is just a personal preference but i really hate it when you're three quarters of the way through a book you know there's magic in the book. You have no idea what the magic can do. Everyone is about to be completely fucked. The enemy is there. They're being sworn. And then all of a sudden, the mage just shows up, does something that you've never seen in the book beforehand, <laughs> and then you never see it again later. And I'm just like, but why? <laughs> just, that feels lazy doesn't it oh yeah i hate that yes <laughs> so i i did want to make very hard rules that i could then hopefully expand on and do new cool things with but i wanted there to be kind of a groundwork and then you did say there are magic systems so mm -hmm. there's the second system which is uh really fun because basically and it's completely separate from the other system. Fascinatingly um, different, yes. <laughs> and 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 basically, what happens here is uh, you you're you're just a person, and you're you're living your life, and then all of a sudden, you might have a voice in your head, and this is uh, really hard to uh, explain, I guess, with certainty because I haven't worked this part out all the way, I guess. <laughs> It's it. <laughs> uh, spirit, the living embodiment of someone else. I, I, an old mage basically has created this way to live live eternally through other people. So they might just randomly spring up inside of you, and if they do, they can see everything you see. They can hear everything you uh, say. They know every single thought you have. In fact, most of the time when you're communicating with them, you you could do it just completely mentally, no talking out loud. Of course, uh, that is kind of a funny dynamic with a character uh, because they talk out loud sometimes. But normally, you probably wouldn't do that very often. Uh, but in, in that circumstance, it's a little different. Uh, mm -hmm. But this spirit mage thing that's living inside of you will be there until you die basically it's a permanent uh groupie <laughs> 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 and it unlocks the uh, ability to use magic through what is called imbuing and so you if you have a weapon in your hand or 
or you know, it could be a bow and arrow, what it could be any weapon basically. You can then imbue it with different elemental powers. So you can light your sword on fire, you can turn your sword into lava, you could uh turn it into a shard of ice, uh, you can use it to generate like wind or air or force, uh, so many different things, but you have to have the weapon in your hand. And if you don't, you can't use that magic at all. Very creative addition to the story. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens as these <laughs> two different types of magic are going to come into more relation, connection, conflict, wherever this goes. Uh, there's, it's already been hinted a little bit, you know, in the first book here, but I, I'm sure there's more to come. And perhaps you're still waiting to see what happens too when your brain thinks of it. So <laughs> we're looking forward <laughs> sure. to all of this for sure. Uh, another question from Zach is, and this certainly aligns with Grimdark. He wants to know if you plan on letting any of your main characters live to the end of the series. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now don't answer that. This is just Zach's humor. Um, but, you know, I, I do... <sighs> the thing is, it's, it's Grimdark in the sense that anyone reading this should quickly come to understand that no one is safe. Any crap can happen to anybody. There's no one who has perfect plot armor. This is all bets are off. Things are going to happen. And I love that aspect of it. There's nobody who is a made man. No. Let's just see where the chips right. fall. I, I just love the element of not knowing who's safe and who's not. Yeah. It's my favorite thing about reading a book. If, if to me that the characters in the book feel invincible, I'm kind of out. I, mm -hmm. I need to feel like they're in danger. Yeah. Uh, it's and more real. I'll, right. And I will tell you this. This is not a spoiler. I do have a lot of big plot elements in my head kind of plotted out. I am not a plotter. I don't plot. But when I got halfway through the Trials of Ashman, I realized I really need to come up with, like, the ending. So I came up with, like, where I was going with the story. But I have no idea which characters are actually going to get there. I, yeah, have, I love that. Yeah. I have ideas in my head. But, and again, without, I'm not going to spoil anything, but in, in the sequel, there is actually a character, two characters, in fact, that I planned on having going much farther. And when I got to where they were in their scenarios, it was just like, oh, I, I don't, I don't think it'd be realistic to save them. And as much as that killed me, I had to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. You're just being authentic with where the story takes you. No, that's right. good. That's good. All right. Let's step out of the story itself for a moment and talk about the publishing process. I know getting published as an author is rough. Uh, I've got a friend, Eric, Patreon supporter. I know you'll watch this. Uh, he's been trying to get a YA fantasy series that he's written, picked up for a number of years now good luck. and despite it being good quality he's gotten great feedback from beta readers for him and such he's just gotten to be very familiar with rejection um, so tell us about your experience deciding to self-publish i mean did you try to get this picked up by a publishing house first or did you just say i'm just self-publishing I mean, tell us about your experience all right i have a story that I'll tell very quickly, but before that story, uh, I would, I queried for maybe a day before I realized, nah, I'm not going to do this traditional publishing crap because each agent requires all these different things. So every time you query a different agent, you have to change your entire thing. And it just, to me, that's too much work. And I already know, you know, to this day, it's been a year now, more than a year since I queried, and I've probably only heard back from half of them. Mm. Now, I know that some of them don't send responses, and probably I'm not going to hear from a rejection from any of the others. I, I don't know. And also, I probably queried too early because it was before I did one of my uh, ads. But either way, 
I'm just not patient enough. Uh, I figured now's the time to shoot my shot. So I self published and I don't regret it because like you said, uh, that guy, Eric, I think you said his name was yeah, waiting for years. Right. And it's just to me, if you have good feedback like that, invest the money, get a, a good cover, do the editing, throw it out there, throw it to reviewers and hope that it does well uh, because, you know, how many years are you going to wait to try and get picked up? A lot of people do. I'm just, I, I can't be that patient. <laughs> uh, now, the, now the story, part of my process, I can't name names here and I can't, uh, you know, I, I think I'd be kind of impro- unprofessional, but when I was pre-published, my idea was I'm going to self-publish and I'm going to, uh, put this book out is going, I'm going to have the ebook, the paperback, the hardcover and the audiobook version. Uh, now in order to do all those, and I don't, I still don't have an audiobook version, but in order to do those, I was reaching out to different people to get services done. Right now, I, again, I can't say what or who or any services or any of that because I can't give away who it is, but I reached out to someone that's huge in the community, uh, in some form of book production, whatever. I, I again, I don't want to be too specific uh, uh, publicly, but they were really positive about the book. And like I said, huge name out there. And I was like, oh my god, the fact that this person is interested is so cool. And they themselves were like, hey, I also do work for this uh, publisher, smaller publisher, not not a big one but it's still Mm -hmm. traditional would you be interested in maybe uh going for them because i can hook you up with the owner and i was like that would be great and so i I, you know she sent me to him and i started i just gave away the genders doesn't matter uh (laughs) just 50 percent of the world is out that's okay that's okay that's true (laughs) so anyway talking with them and uh Unfortunately, uh, they I send in my query. They never responded. The website has a very clear like deadline. Like if you haven't heard from us by then, then you should contact us. And I was like, oh okay. So I reached out, and I got nothing again. And I was like, what? Why are why am I not hearing from this person? So I waited another couple months, and by this time it had been. I don't remember how long, six months, eight months. Uh, and I was getting to the point where it was like, okay, you guys need to like tell me, am I in, am I not in, or I like need to actually publish this book. So I emailed them again and and maybe, maybe I was a little too direct or forward. I don't know, but I was like, Hey, I, I just want an answer like one way or the other. And uh, if you're still interested, that'd be great. But I need to kind of figure out what I'm doing here. And they responded and said, yeah, we gave you, we were giving you a chance because of who like put us in contact with, but yeah, we're not interested. And I, I I kind of think that might've been because I emailed them again. I don't know. Uh, But they even got the title of the book wrong. So I was like, okay, I'm kind of glad that I didn't go with you guys anyway, (sighs) because you don't even know what the book is. (laughs) So that kind of trials of ash pile. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) uh, I don't oh. remember what they said, but they <laughs> they completely butchered it, and I was like, "Oof, okay, well, <laughs> wow. I'm uh, I'm not. I just when that happened, I said, I'm just self publishing. I'm not going to deal okay. with this anymore." <laughs> it speaks to a little bit how many people are out there writing books and trying to get published, and like you said, one percent making it, right? Ninety nine percent. Just throwing the books out into the wilderness and nobody cares. Nobody's right. doing anything. Thank goodness for the opportunity to relatively easily self-publish now compared yeah, to a lot of... the free digital age. Yes, definitely. The digital stuff has made it so much easier. And I do want to say on behalf of the person I'm talking about here uh, who might not have treated me the way I would like to have been treated, 
I understand that they were probably really overwhelmed with submissions because I think I'm guessing here because I can't ever remember time very well, but I think that was in 2021 or right, right. Yeah. I think it would have been towards the end middle of 2021. I think when I first contacted, so COVID had been happening for a year and apparently according to everything I've read online, when that happened, a huge amount of people started Everybody writing. Everybody started writing. Books. And so <laughs> I would not be surprised if they just had a massive catalog. And and that's fine. But, you know, I would have at least been nice if you followed the own terms you put out on your own right, website. Right, right. And also knew the title of the book. But it's... Well, you know, I'm banking, John, that you're going to become – you know, one of these people like uh, Michael J. Sullivan with the Ryura Revelations, self-published, got so popular that then a publisher reached out to him and said, hey, can we publish your book? That would be amazing. That's And like when that I happens, I'm going to gonna be like, yeah, and, and John's friend, pat him on the head. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I you're more optimistic than I am because uh, I just don't think that I'm that well-known, but you know, hopefully in the future, that would be amazing. I would love to get there. Well, let's talk about how you how you are getting known. You know, your book is getting decent ratings. You know, four out of five stars on Amazon. 4.15 out of five on Goodreads. So, you know, it's up there in the upper levels. How is the Trials of Ashmount doing in sales? I if you don't want to answer, that's fine, but, you know. No, I'm a very open book when it comes to this, uh, so it's fine. Uh, I think uh, right now we're at, uh, I haven't checked exact numbers for a while, but I think it was like 2,100 sales now. To to also be completely honest, uh, probably 800 of those were free downloads during a free promotion I did. Uh so that's, you know, if you do 2,100 minus 800, so like maybe like 1,300-ish sales for like actual money. And okay. again, most of those at 99 cents because when I first launched, it was at 2.99. But I I uh, don't know if you know the author, Ryan uh, Cahill, Cahill. I do. Ryan Cahill. Um, I haven't read his stuff yet, but it's on my TBR. So I actually kind of knew him before. This sounds so, I hate this, but like before he was famous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of. He actually ran a uh, writing group on Facebook, and I was also running it with, like we were together in the administration. Uh, and right then, I think he had just published his first book a few months before I mm -hmm. first joined as in an admin there. Uh, but I kind of have talked to him on and off a little bit about his strategies. And so when I found out that he put his book down to 99 cents and just saw a huge increase in sales, I did the same thing. And it's true. It, it really made a huge difference and helped me get it out there a lot. Uh, and now my second book's coming out, which I know is a, question later but i did increase the uh price of that one i think it's 3.99 yep and so that Since i pre-purchased i know it's 3.99 <laughs> thank you thank you uh but that that is where i think money being made is going to happen because if you're if you're talking strictly how much money have you made um this is a guess because i i don't have uh the Total, it's really hard on Ingram Spark to figure out how much actual money is made for physical copies. Mm -hmm. uh, but digitally, I've made a, almost $850, I think. And then if I combine that with a guess of the physical sales, uh, I'm probably at $1,200, I'm guessing, okay. in less than a year, which doesn't sound good. I, I, I do hear what everyone's thinking. But if you look up the average amount of money a self-published make a self-published author makes in a year, I think it's like a thousand dollars, and that's just 
in general, self-published author, not, not one book. It's your whole catalog. Now, yeah. how accurate is that information? I do not know, <laughs> but I, I, uh, if, if that's what I'm judging it based off of, and I, I wouldn't be surprised because there's a lot of, you know, authors that don't make anything really because it's, it's really hard to get out there. And I definitely sympathize with that. But uh, and, and to go back to the question, uh, how well am I doing now with sales? Uh, I, I generally average about a sale a day, I guess. Uh, if, if you're stretching it out some days, you know, yeah. three, yeah. some days zero, but uh so it's, it's not bad. Well, the formula you're following, I've seen a lot of uh, self-published people doing too. It's kind of the, the old drug dealer format, <laughs> you know, Psh, have a taste, you know, and, and 99 cents, you know, and then they want more. So then they'll pay more for the next book, you know, get them to experience it because you're an unknown. I don't know who you are. There's no reputation. There's just this book with a nice cover. Okay. Maybe I'll like it, you know, and give them the chance to try it. And I think they would like it. I'm honestly shocked you haven't sold more yet. Not that you've done anything wrong. I'm just saying the book is that good that it, you should, people should be reading this book. So uh, we'll just wait for the breakthrough. It's going to happen. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Study um, the course. It's that good. Um, so you mentioned audiobook has not happened yet, and that is a way, a primary way. A lot of people I know who listen to our content, watch our YouTube channel, primary way they do books is audio these days. So yep. that's probably expensive to get into audiobook format. Am I right? Yeah, so I, uh, I've gotten different quotes uh, from different people, and it is an insane amount of money out of pocket. If you're looking at, you know, I've I've looked everywhere from some really big names to some unknown people. Well, maybe not the not unknown, but like middle of the ground, I guess. And I, so the first quote I got uh, was from a really big professional, and that was like seven thousand five hundred. And I was like, yeah. okay, well, that's wow. not, you know affordable right and then i went down the line a little bit <laughs> i got another quote for and this is this is from someone who probably doesn't have the same name recognition but is still super professional mm -hmm. and that was like four thousand five hundred yeah. i think and i had another couple uh quotes for around that uh, number two and then if you go cheaper than that and I'm not disparaging anybody that does, but from my limited audiobook narration uh, understanding, the quality dramatically decreases pretty quickly because yeah. after you get below, now I'm talking about my book size, uh, which sure. is 150, 140,000 words for the Trials of Ashman. Uh If you're talking about my book size, the amount of hours that everyone thinks it's going to take to produce and read it. Uh, if you go below about $4,000, then you're getting into budget narrators uh, from, from my understanding. And the lower you go there, the riskier it would be, I, I guess. Uh, now, I'm sure there are plenty of great narrators out there who would charge me $2,000. I don't know. All I know is that if I did spend two thousand dollars, it would be below the average uh, wage for an audiobook narrator yeah. who knows what they're doing. I guess would be a way of saying that. And I'm always hesitant to do that with anything. I and that might just be a me problem because well, you'd hate I... to see the narration quality <laughs> turn someone off of your book, right? And I'm not an audiobook listener at all, so I don't really know what good and bad narration sounds like. So I'm even mm. more apprehensive to just, okay, I don't know who you are. Here's, you know, $1,500 and you're going to read it. I don't know if 
you know, they could send me the whole book done and I would have no idea if that was going to be good or bad because I, I never have listened to an audiobook in my life uh-huh. and I, I never will. I just, yeah, I don't, when I, I, when I'm listening to something, uh, I've never actually tried to listen to a book, but I know that when I'm listening to other things like podcasts, YouTube videos, uh, I was going to say music, but I don't ever listen to music. Um, I know this is a hot take, but I don't really like music. Uh, well, songs, anyway. <clears throat> music in general, I can listen to. That's just music. I usually listen to someone I'm writing. But anyway, when I'm listening to a podcast or like a YouTube video, I do pay attention. But I often, you know, won't be paying attention or I'll kind of drift off in my thoughts and... So I, I know that if I listen to an audiobook, I would struggle to retain or mm-hmm. uh, know everything that happened. And that just that bugs me to such a way that I'll just never even try it. <laughs> well, I, I hope eventually this will come to audiobook because oh, I, I know I enjoyed it. reading it. Just I read it in the Kindle version. That's how I read most of my books. But at the same time that I'm reading something in Kindle, I'm always listening to something else in audio. Because when I'm driving, when I'm doing chores, when I'm out exercising, I like to keep the mind busy. And right. audiobooks work for me. Not every book could be audio. There's no way I'd be doing Malazan in audio. Uh, <laughs> and I did John Gwynn's The Faithful and the Fallen in audiobook format. And I had to start the first book three times because I was so oh. lost. There was too much. That was one I should have read. You know, so it's true. Some books you can't do audio very well. Right. I think yours would play to audio and, and I've listened to a lot of stuff. I, I think yours would do a good job there, but when you're making enough money that it justifies hitting right. the audience, I think that's what you're going to need to wait for. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I did. A, I did apply to podium, which is a publisher for uh, audiobooks. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard back from them, but, uh, and then the, they would do it for free. And then, we like split the profits or whatever. Okay, so, profit sharing. Uh, yeah, you know, hey. yeah, that would it be could great. Work. It but could work. again, haven't heard from them yet. But okay, hopefully. <laughs> All right, uh, just a few last questions here, and kind of getting away from just the 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 actual writing, the publishing, and stuff, more into some fun stuff. You know, Zach and I both have read your bio, the stuff you chose to put out there. It's kind of entertaining. And it spawned a couple of questions for Zach in particular, and I'm interested too. So those who haven't read your bio yet, they can find it on Twitter. They can find it on Goodreads. You know, it's out there. Um, They need to go find it for themselves. But here's things Zach wants to know. You say in your bio that you basically don't like anything that poops. (laughs) But if you had to pick... Would you go cats or dogs? It's an easy question. Uh, dogs, because about 50% of cats I'm like really allergic to. Oh, well, that does. Kinda... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Zach is the dog person. I'm the cat person. No cat allergies. So it wasn't an issue there. You got to walk your dog. I never had to walk my cat. See, so. Yeah. If we're talking like personality, I definitely would probably choose a cat. I just like what they do. But you Uh, like to breathe. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) If I, you know, if I get like a cat hair in my eye, it swells up and I can't, you know, breathe. It's terrible. The whole thing is just, I become a snotty mess. Like it's just, yeah, yeah, it's really bad. Especially the, it's like the long haired ones, I think for the Uh most part. Wow. I, I don't know. You also mentioned in your bio that you have a love for video games. So Zach wants to know what would be your top two or three video games. And that could be of all time or just right, right now, you know, wherever you want to take it. It's that. It's a really hard All question. I know about video games is I'm awful at them. Zach kicks <laughs> my butt at things like that. So he's the video game guy. He wants to know. Uh, so it's, it's such a good question. It's so hard to narrow it down to three uh maybe my favorites of all time and and that's it's so hard because it's like well multiplayer or story based or what so right you know i i'm a big fan of the mass effect series the dragon age series uh 
I, 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 I know also, Zach did a lot of Mass Effect. He he got that. Yeah. Yeah, those games are great. For uh, great story, great characters. Uh, uh, so outside of maybe story, but and uh, probably Skyrim is a really good contender. Um, okay. I also, you know, going old school. I was a big fan of Age of Empires, uh, Command and Conquer, uh, Diablo Two. Oh yeah, back of. in the day, Diablo Two. Yep. I, I did that. Um, I could win in that one. I could, <laughs> and then I'd go off of easy mode and then start to lose. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so I, man, I don't know. And I'm, you know, we're gonna get off of this, and I'm gonna be like, oh my god, I can't believe I didn't talk about my favorite, my actual favorite game. Uh, but but I, did you ever play The Last of Us? See, I was about to forget The Last of Us. That's one of my. Uh, you know, The Last of Us 1 is a 10 out of 10 amazing game. And then I would give The Last of Us 2 maybe a 1 out of 10. I really didn't like The Last Ooh, of Us 2. Wow. Uh, well, if we're are talking, the channel of hot takes. Right. So if we're talking about go. just, like, story, um, gameplay, The Last of Us 2 is, I would say, a 10 out of 10 again. I mean, it, great gameplay. Uh, mm -hmm. Still, the mechanics were awesome. I just really hated a lot of the story decisions myself. But, you know. Well, that doesn't give a lot of hope then for the next season of The Last of Us on HBO. Uh, yeah, for me, I'm not excited at all. I'll still watch it, but I anticipate hating it. I, I don't think that you've played the games, right? I have not. I've just right. enjoyed the show, and season one was great. But now, apparently, yeah. we're all going to hate season well, two. I, you know, it depends on what you're looking for, and it depends on what they do. They might change things, and you might still like it. I'm I don't just, know. Uh, I'm just thinking it's going to parallel, and we're going to be talking about, wow, the cinematography was <laughs> awesome, and the way the cameras and, and stuff, but the story was horrible. Yeah, <laughs> I, That's how I kind of think it might be. Now, another amazing post-apocalyptic video game for the story is actually the Telltale games of The Walking Dead. Now, I oh, yeah. have... I have played of, those. Yes. Have you? The I have. Spectacular stories. Absolutely. I, I loved it. Uh, Clementine. It was, man. Yes. Oh. Uh, so much like heart wrenching, just crazy stuff happens in those games. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's just so much better than like the core show, which I really loved in the beginning. And it really, to me, kind of really fell apart. But, it, it lost its ways. Um, I watched the whole thing. I've got a yeah. whole episode on The Walking Dead. Um, I've got two episodes on The Walking Dead actually <laughs> out there on our channel. Uh, but I was glad I watched all the way through. But certainly the earlier stuff is better. And it was closer to the source material as they wandered farther away. Yeah, I, mean, it's I haven't read it, but yeah. And, and actually, I'm. this is a hot take too, but uh, Fear of the Walking Dead. I love that show. Oh, it's a great show. Now I'm only on season four. I'm behind. I'm behind. Season four is, in my opinion, when it becomes a great show. Okay. Uh, All right. I, I thought that there was good and a lot of struggling before season four. But then season four, I believe they changed showrunners. They introduced a bunch of new characters. And it mm -hmm. really they did. Really, yeah. uh, really injected a lot of life into it. I, I loved it. And I really liked uh, seasons five and six. And then, I'm, don't worry, I'm not spoiling anything for, for you. But season seven, I, I think... I think it was filmed during COVID. So you can tell there's a lot okay. of like, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's boring, but it's a, a lot, lot of solo slower. exposition moments. <laughs> well, something does happen that separates people uh, storyline wise. And then uh -huh. you can, you can just tell it's COVID because they all are in their groups, like kind of separated in the show and there's not really much interaction yeah. because it's like, okay, clearly COVID happened. <laughs> hard, hard for these producers when you're managing yeah. the COVID and issues. You, yeah. The same thing happened in the walking dead too. When you could tell when COVID happened, because it mm -hmm. was like, Oh my God, what is and it, that actually was way worse than what happened on the fear of the Walking dead. Cause they had all those standalone episodes that were like so boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's make sure everyone knows the answer now. Uh, your next book. Again, I've pre-ordered it, so I know the answer. Uh, <laughs> second book in the Tragedy of Sedane series. When is it going to be available to people? So, the second book comes out June 1st. Buzzard's Ball. 
and uh, and they can already pre-order. Yes, uh, just just the digital edition. I'm still working out uh, the physical edition. I'm I'm trying to get that up in time. Now, if I'm correct, and I I could be saying wrong things. I know that if you publish through Amazon, they don't allow pre-orders for physical editions for self-published authors. Okay. I think because I go through Ingram Spark, I I think they do. I could be wrong. I haven't tried it before because uh, literally when I was publishing the Trials of Ashmount, I had entered it into a self-published contest called the SPFBO run by Mark Lawrence. Okay. And I didn't actually have everything ready to publish until about the day before the contest started. And when the contest starts, you have to be published. So it was like a night or two before it officially started that I clicked publish. And uh, so I didn't actually have time to see if there was any uh, pre-orders really. <laughs> yeah, I was, that was another So you're way time. ahead. You're way That's ahead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and fun facts. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Buzzard's Bowl is actually coming out a year to the day that the Trials of Ashmount did. So that's nice. kind of cool. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it's it's mind-blowing, really, to think about your book's been published less than a year. It's only been, yep. what, like nine months? About. Yep. Yeah. June 1st will be the uh, one-year anniversary. It's uh, crazy. Ten years from now, you're gonna be looking back, remembering these early <laughs> days, and you know, before all those millions of copies had been purchased. Yeah, maybe, and wow, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll actually make money. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? That would be nice. Now you have made money, just not enough to cover what you spent on it so far. And oh yeah, not even close. <laughs> that's not so much different than being a content creator. I. We do have a few people, thank you very much, who support us on Patreon, but it hasn't come anywhere close to cover what I've poured in money-wise to produce this. It's my right. hobby. It's what I love to do. And that's partly inspiring you, too. You love to write. You love that you've got a book out there that people are enjoying, that they're talking about. And gee, it'd be nice if this would catch on enough so that you could just do this. That would be great. That's the dream, right? That is the dream. I mean, uh, so full transparency, I actually don't have a job right now. I'm basically a full-time author without the income of a full-time author. But I uh, I live with my mom right now. Uh, my dad is in a nursing home. So and my mom was in a car accident and had a lot of uh, a really bad car accident, has some lingering injuries, uh, can't do some physical things. So I am single. I'm not doing anything. Uh, if I did move out, it would not be far away probably. So we have a, a, a big house so we can live here without a problem. And mm -hmm. so I just live at home and she has a dog business. Uh, she raises, uh, King Charles Cavalier Spaniels and breeds them. And that's kind of where a lot of her income comes from. Cause my dad's pension basically pays for him in the nursing home. And that's about it. Well, thankful so, for that at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually own a dog and I make money through the dog. And that's literally how I uh, pay the few bills I have and fund my books. So obviously it's not a permanent situation, but I'm hoping that if I just, if, 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 if the graph of sales and money starts to go up, mm -hmm. then uh, I'll be good. I can, you know, keep going. Uh, so yep. that's, my goal is just to see an increase. And as long as it continues to increase, I think I'll be fine to continue being a full-time author. Good. But, you know. Spontaneous question. Does Did your mom read your book? She, yes. Uh, so my mom is different than a lot of moms. She really likes the fantasy that I read. So for probably 10 years now, I, I will buy books. Might actually be 15 years now. Uh, I will buy books that I really like. I will read them. I will give them to her. She will read them about 95% of the time. We're on the same wavelength. Yeah, that's great. Liking that's great. the same books. So she did read my book and she really liked it. 
And so uh, that's great. I, I thought that was awesome. It does sometimes run in the family. Obviously, my <laughs> son and I share a lot of interests in literature, but go the other direction. I love to read because of my mother. And I've got her reading The Wheel of Time right now. And she plans to move on to the expanse. And that's done because I'm, I'm passing along things. And she read <laughs> nice. A Song of Ice and Fire because, hey, you know, this is good stuff, mom. You know, so, yeah, it happens yeah. sometimes. It's a lot of fun when that's the case. All right. Last question. This is from Zach. Are there any fun surprises in the upcoming book um, or the one after that? That you're just thinking, well, no, you're actually already writing the one after that, the third one. You're working yeah. on it. Yep. Now, again, no spoilers, but just without outright spoiling, can you say, yes, there are some fun surprises? Or is there <laughs> anything you could tease us with that if we've read the book and you say this teeny little bit, we'll go, oh, is there anything like that you want to toss our way? Sure. Uh First of all, there are in both, both books two and three uh, some really new uh, or some, some really fun new characters. But nice. uh, specifically in book two, if, 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 if you've read book one, you'll know that there were a couple uh, interludes that kind of uh, focused on different characters. Uh, I really liked writing those interludes. Uh, and I did get a lot of feedback, uh, positive feedback on those inter uh, interludes. Which is good because by the time I got most of this positive feedback, the second book was almost completely written. But during the time I was writing book two, I was like, man, I really like those interludes. It's like a breath of fresh air when I'm writing because I'm one of those people that can get really bored with uh, just doing the same thing over and over again. So that's why the order of the POV chapters are not like predictable. Uh, I switch it around kind of randomly. Yep. I'll get to the end of a cha chapter and I'll be like... Who do I want to write about next? And I'll just type the uh, person's name as the title, and and that's who I go with. And so it it's works. Kind of, yeah, yeah, okay. it's kind of random. But in in book two, there are a lot more interludes because uh, one, I realized I wanted them, <laughs> and two, uh, I just think they were necessary to show different uh, maybe sides and maybe things that the main character wouldn't see or know yep. that I wanted readers to know. So I, the, if you did like the interludes, there are quite a bit more of them. Nice. That seems natural. Your world's getting bigger. The story's getting bigger. You need more interludes. Yeah. yeah so it's kind of ironic because I, this isn't a spoiler, I don't think, but the trials of Ashmount starts with uh, five characters in five different countries. And book two without, again, spoiling anything, really starts to narrow a bit. Uh, and then I'm writing book three now, and it's even getting more narrow. But it's funny because as as we narrow some stuff down, I, I do feel like we're expanding a lot too. And uh, it's it's been a interesting time. I, the book three is a lot different feeling to me than the first two books. I've written okay. 20,000 words in that uh, book so far. Now, I know a lot of people don't understand word count if you're not a writer. So to give context for that, uh, The Trials of Ashmount is 140,000 words and book two is 150,000 words. So it's not like a lot, but it's a, it's a decent chunk. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised at how much hasn't happened. Now, I I don't mean that it's boring. I just mean that when I started writing the book, I had I have these kind of uh, points in my head, and I don't plot, but I always think about them. And I had these places in mind of things I wanted to hit, and I haven't even hit the first one yet. And so I'm just like, man, what is this one going to be a lot longer, or are th are things going to start really slow in, and then really kind of build up and blow up? I don't know because I really quite the discovery writer. I just go for it and let's see what happens. <laughs> what you're describing is how book 12 of the wheel of time became book 12, 13 and 14. Cause sometimes <laughs> there's just so much still that you have to say that has to be done while you're getting to the main points, you know, we're happening. So maybe right. it will be a bigger book. We'll see. 
I'm looking forward to it. Just keep writing, keep enjoying, (laughs) and I know that we'll enjoy it when we get to see it. Uh, John, again, thank you for being with us here today. This has been fantastic. Uh, Appreciate all that you've been able to share. Uh, Those of you watching, if you've enjoyed it, again, reminder, like the episode. uh, Share it out to other people. Let them know, because this is a great way for them to learn about this, uh, got to point that way, this book and what's coming and why they might want to check this out. Uh, I firmly endorse it. Great book. So does Zach. And, you know, get out there, find this book. It's available everywhere you want to find books, except audio. But if enough people buy it, audio will show up eventually, too. (laughs) So let's go, people. Let's do it. That's very true. Yeah. Um, John, I know people can find you in lots of ways, but why don't you point blank tell them? I'll have it in your show notes. But go ahead and how can they find you if they want to talk with you? So, I'm most active on Twitter, I think. Uh, if you follow me at a grim bastard, uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's where I'm great, at on great uh, name. Twitter. I also just launched a uh, Discord server that I'm pretty uh, active in uh, for now. And that's uh, there's a link to that in my uh, link tree on Twitter. Uh, it's actually inspired by... It, it's called the Dripping Bucket, which is uh, a tavern name that Michael R. Fletcher uh, came up with. And for people that don't know, uh, it's kind of a a joke because the name of that tavern shows up in a ton of fantasy books. Uh, a lot of self-published. Uh, Peter McLean, or is it McLean? McLean. He wrote The War of the uh, Rose Throne, and he's traditionally published, and he has it in his book, too. Uh, and fun fact, The Dripping Bucket does appear in book two of my book. Nice. Uh, yep, yeah, and uh, and in book three, actually. So it, it's kind of uh, just a funny thing I mean, that... It's uh, Easter little egg Easter egg, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you can find in uh, a lot of self-published books, mostly, but... Nice. All right. And, of course, you do have your YouTube channel, so they can come and yes. uh, follow hot along there, discussion. listen to your hot takes, and uh, see what else you've got coming out. All right. Well, thank you again for being here. I'm going to run my outro now to remind everybody of all various ways they can get a hold of us. Uh, I can never say enough to like and subscribe, please. But yes, we also have a Discord. Now I got to go find John's Discord and join that one too. <laughs> uh, I know we already see you around ours. So, you know, reciprocate. Here we go. Uh, there's our Patreon page. If you really want to keep this stuff coming out on our channel, become a supporter. Uh, you get to some extra benefits by that, like getting our stuff early. I was like it, joining us for live episodes of all kinds. Social media, all the ways from there, and even email. You can email us if you actually check. I think we've had six over three years but you know it's there all right thanks everyone for being here we'll talk to you, you next time <laughs>